Um, John chapter 7. Have you ever been chased by anyone? There's all different levels of being chased, right? When you're a kid, you play chase, which is a fun game. Like chase me and you run around trees and houses and trampolines, unless your trampoline was wrapped around a tree in a tornado, like Alan and Rachel's was this week, but they safely survived in their storm shelter. Chased, playing chase as a kid. And then when you get a little older, being chased may not be so much fun in games. If there's blue lights involved, right, being chased or pursued by someone. When I was a teenager um, and I was involved in some pranks, which you should not be involved in, like rolling yards. Um, uh, this is a, let, me, let me say it. This is a hypothetical story. It's not real. <laughs> I was rolling yards one night. And uh, my friends and I had rolled this particular yard, and we saw a cop car in the distance coming by and slowing down. So we did what we only knew to do, which was take off running into the woods nearby. And then I realized that the cops were going to see us, and so I just hit the ground, like laid flat on the ground in the dirt, and the cop slowed way down. And all of a sudden, I saw his spotlight come out, going through the yard into the woods, And I just buried my face in the dirt, and his light literally went right over my head. And I breathed a sigh of relief. Uh, Not that I would have been arrested, but my dad would not have been pleased if I had been caught rolling yards that night. But I was being pursued. And that that seems kind kind of innocent, right? Other people have been caught or chased and pursued uh, at a more intense level where there were things on the line, like going to jail or being exposed or being caught for something, but that feeling of like looking over your shoulder. And then in today's society, it's very easy um, to stalk people is a phrase that we hear a lot now with technology and people being stalked online. And that type of stalking gets a lot more severe than what you guys have heard me describe about our dog, Toby, um, who is a Brittany Spaniel. So Toby is uh, naturally a, a hunting dog, a a pointer dog, or he's actually a, a sitter dog, and so he will sit and stare and stalk prey in our yard, namely rabbits and squirrels. And so this morning when Ashley left and I was up getting ready and preparing for the message and getting my final thoughts together, he literally sat by the window for a solid hour and 15 minutes staring at rabbits in our yards jumping around, and if we let him out, he'll stalk them, lift one leg slowly and put it down, Lift another leg slowly, put it down. Never caught a single rabbit, but he's an expert stalker. Stalking is all in the news. It's been made headlines recently that Aaron Andrews, who is a famous ESPN reporter, won a $55 million lawsuit because she was being stalked and then stayed in a particular hotel and they allowed the stalker unknowingly supposedly to stay right next door to her and he did something in the peephole and filmed her getting dressed and all these crazy things that can happen. We hear all types of of things about cyber stalking and hunting people down online. It's that idea of being stalked or pursued, of constantly looking over your shoulder. There's two certainties in life. You are born... Obviously, you're here this morning, and you die. Every human has a fatal stalker, the grim reaper. Death is stalking you. And from the moment you are born, you begin to die. And death is stalking you, and one day, death will strike. Isn't that amazing news? Death is coming and is stalking you. And we don't know how or where or when. We just know that all of us have an appointment with death, that all of us are headed to our tombstone. What's going to be written on our tombstones? I saw a couple of uh, funny tombstones this week that I wanted to show you guys online. Here's a couple of uh, humorous tombstones. He loved bacon. Oh, and his wife and kids too. Great tombstone. How about this one? I told you I was sick. (laughs) My grandfather, who passed away probably 10 years ago now, loved him dearly. We were extremely close, but for about the last two years of his life, he would just walk around muttering, sick, sick, sick. And so I thought, say, we were going to put that on his tombstone. I told you I was sick. How about this one? Died. 
from not forwarding that text message to 10 people. We've all gotten that threat before. And then I love this last one. <laughs> Kids crying because Santa Claus died. We're all headed to our appointment with the tombstone. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 says that we all have an appointment with death. And just as it was appointed for man to die once and after that the judgment, we all have an appointment with death. And so we live life looking over our shoulder that death is coming. Every human faces the reality that one day they will die, that we get one life. We are not a cat. We do not get nine lives. Speaking of cats, my favorite animal in the world, I found out this week how to bathe your cat. Ready for it? They have nine lives. So here's instructions on how to bathe your cat. One, thoroughly clean the toilet. Two, add the required amount of shampoo in the toilet water and have both lids lifted. Three, obtain the cat and soothe him while you carry him towards the bathroom. Four, in one smooth movement, put the cat in the toilet and close both lids. You may need to stand on the lid so he cannot escape. Caution, do not get any part of your body too close to the edge as his paws will be reaching out to grab anything they can find. The cat will self-agitate and make ample suds. Never mind the noises that come from your toilet. The cat is actually enjoying this. Number five, flush the toilet three or four times. This provides a power wash and rinse, which I found to be quite effective. Number six, have someone open the door to the outside and ensure there are no people between the toilet and the outside door. Seven, stand behind the toilet as far as you can and quickly lift both lids. Eight, the now clean cat will rocket out of the toilet and run outside where he will dry himself. Sincerely signed, the dog. We don't have nine lives like our cats. We have one. But what if I told you that there was a way to escape death, to evade its pending grip as we look over our shoulders at death stalking us? Not just postpone it. As we said last week, we do everything we can to postpone it. Medicine, exercise, diet. Did you know that the healthcare industry is almost a $4 trillion a year industry in the United States? Seeking to postpone death. But what if we could escape it entirely? That's a foreign concept to us because we all die. We're in a series called Escape. And in this series, we are talking about a man who not only escaped death, but conquered it and offers eternal life to those who follow him, that Jesus offers immortality. Man, that sounds so sci-fi, doesn't it? Immortality. Immortality. We've all seen movies of people chasing the elusive fountain of youth, seeking to find immortality. This is not a new pursuit. As a matter of fact, even today there's a billionaire named Dmitry Iskov and his group that is called the 2045 Initiative who are seeking to cheat death. And they're doing it by creating artificial bodies that will house human intelligence. And Iskov and his friends think they can develop a hologram avatar, for lack of a better term, that will house an individual's personality in an artificial brain, and he believes that he will accomplish this within the next three decades, seeking to escape death. In the third century, there was a Chinese emperor named Qin Shi Huang who ingested mercury to gain eternal life, and it did not work. <laughs> don't try that at home. Don't crack open the thermometer. Immortality. It sounds very sci-fi. And yet, Jesus claims that he conquered death and offers eternal life to his followers. Now, I'm not talking about that Jesus was an escape artist. There's a lot of escape artists that give the illusion that they are escaping death. David Blaine is a current magician, escape artist, illusionist that does many things to try to deceive people. He gained his knowledge and a lot of his expertise from a guy that you might recognize by his picture. I already know that some recognize his picture. I put it up earlier and they called him by name. 
Anybody recognize who that is besides those that already know? A guy named Harry Houdini. Houdini started as a card trick magician. He soon became recognized as an escape artist. He called himself an escapeologist. And handcuffs and chains and ropes and straight jacks and anything else with which people could try to hold him, he would escape. Eventually, Houdini performed fatal escapes like his famous milk can escape, the Chinese water torture cell, and even almost lost his life being buried alive on three different occasions. Houdini was recognized as perhaps the greatest escape artist of all time. Interesting enough, you know how Houdini died? He died of a ruptured appendix that he supposedly received accidentally when a college student delivered multiple hits, multiple blows to Houdini's abdomen with permission, like in, a, in one of his illusions. And these repetitive blows are thought to have been a stunt in which Houdini Houdini was displaying his dexterity. In reality, he died as a result of being hit in the abdomen over and over again. Even the greatest escape artist of all time could not escape death's beckoning call. Now, I don't know about you, maybe I just have a weird sense of humor, but there's something kind of funny to me about Houdini dying from being punched in the stomach like after all, all he went through. It's like the old Superman movies where... They shoot bullets at Superman, they bounce off his chest, and then the villain doesn't know anything else to do, so he throws his gun at Superman, and Superman's like, ooh, dodges the gun and lets it go by. Like, you just got shot in the chest with the bullets. Why did you have to dodge the gun? Uh, It's kind of the same deal, right? Houdini gets punched in the stomach and dies of abdomen blows. But Jesus is not claiming that he just escaped death as an illusionist. Jesus is claiming that he actually defeated death, that he lived, he died, and he lived again, that he punched YOLO in the face, that you not you only live once is a myth when it comes to Jesus. From the opening pages of the Bible, we discover that every human has been issued a death sentence, that with sin came death, and every human has died since the opening act of humanity. And when you read the Old Testament, it says again and again and again, he lived and he died, and he died, and he died. And that prescription has been passed on to each one of us that at some point we will die. But one of the most amazing and interesting subplots in the life of Jesus, in the story of Jesus, is that he constantly lived out uh, this theme, this motif that he has passed from death to life, that those who follow him pass from death to life. And this theme permeates his life, his teachings, his ministry. He spoke about eternal life. He spoke about his own death, talked repeatedly about dying to the point that it confused his followers and they were pulling him to the side saying, Jesus, enough with the death complex. Like, we get it. You're going to die one day. Stop talking about it. And he would talk repeatedly about being murdered, about being killed, and then being raised back to life, making it difficult for people to believe in him. Because he talked about being raised back to life. Like, I get that, right? Like, if you're around a person that was constantly talking about, I'm going to die, but don't worry. After three days, I'm coming back. You're like, let me delete your number right out of my phone right now. All right? If someone was constantly talking about dying and being raised back to life and his followers were constantly saying, Jesus, enough with the death complex. But over and over and over again, Jesus talked about death and life. And the story of Jesus is filled with death plots and death escapes and life and death language and ultimately the claim that he conquered death through the resurrection. Now, let me be clear. Jesus was no exception when it came to death's constant hunt. Death pursued him relentlessly throughout his time on earth. It began when he was a child. Remember the story? Jesus is born. The Magi come to find Jesus. They make a stop at the palace, and they tell Herod, we're here to find King Jesus to worship the Messiah. Herod, feeling very threatened and insecure about his own rulership, said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to kill every child to and under in the land. So I can make sure there's no threatening king. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, tell us this. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, 
<clears throat> rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, escape to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and escaped or departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem in that region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he ascertained from the wise men. The very beginning days of Jesus' life were marked by this hunt from death, that Herod was hunting him to kill him, and Jesus escapes. And it began this cycle that marked his ministry, people wanting to kill him, and yet death was not in control of him. He determined his own fate. Jesus lived with a bounty on his head. Jesus was marked for death, not in a Steven Seagal kind of way, But Jesus was marked for death in the sense that people wanted to kill him. He lived with a death sentence on his life. And repeatedly, the religious leaders in particular, attempted to have him assassinated. Man, that's religion at its finest right now, right right there, right? Religion seeking to kill Jesus constantly. That's in the news everywhere. People killing in the name of religion. And repeatedly, Jesus escaped. Check it out. I want to give you just a a sampling of this from the Scriptures. Let me read just quickly through some verses. Matthew 12, 14. The Pharisees went out and plotted against him as to how they could assassinate him. Mark 11, 18. The chief priests and experts in the law heard it, and they considered how they could assassinate him. Mark 14, 1. Days before the Passover, the chief priests and scribes were trying to find a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. Luke 19, 47, the prominent leaders were seeking to kill him. John 7, 1, he stayed out of Judea because the Jewish leaders wanted to kill him. John 10, 31, the Jewish leaders picked up rocks to stone him. John eleven fifty three. 53, from that day forward, they planned together how to kill him. Again and again and again, the life story of Jesus reads like a Hollywood movie, that Jesus was at the top ten of the most wanted list in his day of people seeking to kill him. Why? What crime did he commit that so infuriated them? Well, if you're here during our Jesus series, we learn that the things that Jesus said is what infuriated people to the point that they wanted to kill him that he claimed to be equal with God. These these were words of blasphemy in his time that were worth a stoning, that he claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath, that he upset the religious system, that he turned it on its head, they upset their system of rules, that he constantly exposed their religious hypocrisy, and they wanted him dead. But he constantly escaped their plots. You see, here's the difference. Jesus was not on their timetable. Jesus was not on death's timetable. Death was on his timetable. Jesus made his own appointment with death because Jesus controls death. I was a big fan of the TV series when it was out, 24. I mean, every kind of red-blooded male has got a little bit of Jack Bauer pumping through their veins, hopefully, right? And so there's this scene in 24 in the last season where Bauer captures this guy and um, he's holding him and, let's just be honest, basically torturing the guy um, and trying to get information out of him. And the guy says to Bauer, why didn't you kill me? And Bauer says this, let's be clear. If I wanted you dead you would be dead already, right? If they wanted, they wanted Jesus dead. But Jesus says, death is on my timetable. You don't control me. Death doesn't control me. I control death. In John chapter 7, Jesus is creating a stir with his teachings. They're calling Jesus a blasphemer. What he is saying is considered blasphemous. And the religious leaders want him dead, but they can't seem to get it done. Pick up in John chapter 7, verse 25. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, 
Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking publicly, speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? So Jesus is speaking openly, publicly at the Feast of the Tabernacles is the context here. This is when thousands and thousands of Jews from all over the known world would gather in Jerusalem the head of, at the beginning of the Passover, and Jesus is openly proclaiming that he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And the religious pe- people despise him and want him dead. And so as Jesus is teaching, the crowd that has gathered begins to have this conversation. Why are they not killing him? We know that they want him dead. The people know about this plot to kill Jesus. Why have they not killed Jesus? And I love their response. Well, is it because the religious leaders really know that he is the Messiah? That it's not just a claim. Man, that had to make the religious leaders' blood boil, right? It's the exact opposite of what they felt and said. Verse 27. But we know, this is the people talking, we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So the people are confused. Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah. He's claiming to be the Son of God. And yet, the people know we watch Jesus play Little League. We know Mary and Joseph. We know his family. We know the house in which he was raised. I've got a table in my house that Jesus helped build with his father. They're confused. Who is this guy that claims to be the son of God, that claims to be the Messiah, but we know his street address? We know that he's from Nazareth for crying out loud. One place in the New Testament, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Are you kidding me? And here Jesus is. I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. Why have they not killed this guy already? Verse 28. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come on my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. Jesus says, let me clear it for you. I am from God. And you do not know that because you do not know God. Again, I don't think Jesus had read the How to Win Friends and Influence People book yet. You think I'm from Nazareth, but in reality I'm from God, and you don't know that because you're not from God. I'm the Son of God. I am the Messiah. And you can't see that because you can't see who God is. Jesus is claiming in these verses to be equal with God. God. Look at their response, verse 30. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. Why? Because his hour had not come. They want to arrest him. They want to kill him, but they can't because his time has not come. They are not in control. Death is not in control. Someone bigger is in control. God, the author of life and death, is in control. If you read the rest of the story, Jesus claims that he is the way to God, to be the way of God, and he goes on to claim that he is the source of spiritual nourishment. That the only way their souls can be fed is through Jesus. That he is the provider of life. That he is the living bread and water from which their spiritual hunger and thirst are quenched. Jesus makes very bold, audacious claims of who he is in these verses. And then look in verse 43 as we kind of pick up the tail end of the story. Their response to Jesus, verse 43. So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. Jesus divided the people. Some believed. Some others believed he was a prophet. Others said he was the Messiah. Others ignored him. Others wanted him dead. But John, the gospel writer, is very clear. In spite of all the different responses to Jesus, no one could touch him. Why? Because death was not in control. Jesus was in control. Isn't this so, 2016? Jesus makes claims of who he is, Son of God, the Messiah, the way to God, and man, there is a plethora of responses to Jesus, right? Some believe, some follow, some check the box, yet Jesus was a great moral guy, a cool guy. 
I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe he ever existed. Sure, maybe he was a great prophet, a great leader. Some believe he was a lunatic. Lots of different responses to Jesus. Who Jesus claims to be continues to generate a lot of responses. The cycle continues. But the thing that we learn both then and now is Jesus is still the author of life and death. Here's some things that we pick up from this passage and several others that are related to this. One, Jesus claims to control death. Jesus claims to hold the key to true life, to eternal life. Now, let me be clear here. Either he does or he does not. Either Jesus is the author of life or he's not. There's like no middle ground here. Jesus is who he claims to be. Jesus did conquer death or he did not conquer death. There's no middle ground option. So if Jesus is who he claimed to be, if his claims are true, based on the story of Jesus, death has no control over Jesus. He repeatedly escaped it, and then he willingly, we'll see next week, he willingly laid down his life and then conquered death by coming back to life. The resurrection, again, is so central to our faith because it validates who Jesus claimed to be. That Jesus said, I'm going to live, die, and live again. And he did it, showing that death has no authority over him. What does that mean for me? What this reminds us of is a few things. It reminds me first, I'm mortal. I am mortal. I live and I die. I'm reminded of my own mortality. I have no control over my death. Death sets my appointment. I am mortal and I will one day die. Now what that should do for us, it should remind us of the urgency and the expectancy of, of death's arrival. Constantly the Bible of both Old and New Testament are calling upon us to be reminded of our mortality. That one day we will live, that we now live and one day we will die. And that we must be prepared, that there's an urgency about our lives to be ready to pass to the next world, to pass from this world to the next. And that we are to live with an urgency and an expectancy that this is not the end of the story, that this life is not all there is, that there's something beyond this, that we are mortal creatures, but that one day we will die and there's something beyond this. And so the story of Jesus and the call of the Bible is a constant reminder to be prepared, to prepare ourselves for death through Christ. We're also reminded through these claims of Jesus that if the claims of Jesus are true, death ultimately has no authority over me. Jesus conquered it. Death does not have the final word that in Jesus, I have been given the gift of eternal life. Now, I'm not sure we always live with our minds wrapped around that truth, that Death, at the end of the day, has no authority over me if I'm a Jesus follower. That my king, my master, has conquered death. And ultimately, he's conquered death on my behalf. That death, the final death sentence, doesn't control me. That Jesus has conquered death. That in Christ, I have been given the gift of eternal life. Now, here's where I think we often kind of miss it on the eternal life thing. I think that we often think in terms, and in, in, when we talk about eternal life, we think of it in terms of what happens beyond the grave, that I will be given the gift of eternal life, which means I will live eternally. But in the New Testament, the concept of eternal life is, is as much about a quality of life as it is a quantity of life, that it's not just about life beyond the grave, but that as we live as Jesus followers in the here and now, we live with eternal life. You hear that clearly? If you're a follower of Jesus, you have eternal life right now. It's not something you'll obtain one day. It's something that you've been given the gift of eternal life now. That means we are to live as people who are alive in Jesus, that we have been given the gift of eternal life, not just a quantity, I'm going to go on forever, but a quality of life, that I've been given life, that I have passed from death to life. Here's, what, here's how that kind of translates for me. That, that means if I've been given the gift of eternal life, it can't be taken from me. Isn't that an incredible blessing? That eternal life can't be taken from me. 
There's a promise that has been given to me by Jesus who says, I hold you in the palm of my hand. No one can take you out of my hand, that you have been given the gift of eternal life. And so how that translates into my everyday life is it's not this constant struggle to try to please God and earn my eternal life. That because I have life, I'm drawn to please Jesus. I'm drawn to live in obedience. I'm motivated to serve Him. Because I've been given the gift of eternal life, I'm going to live like a person that's free. I think sometimes we live with this kind of mentality in the back of our minds, like, well, if I don't do X, Y, and Z, I'm not sure I'm going to make it to heaven. And you talk to the average American in our culture and say, you know, basically upon what grounds are you going to make it into heaven, man, they're going to start rattling off the list, right? Well, I'm better than this guy, and I don't do this, and I behave better than him, and well, at least I don't behave this way, or we have kind of our list of sins or the really bad sins that we don't commit. But if we really believe that eternal life is what it is, we do away with the list. None of us earn eternal life. It's what Jesus has done for us. My eternal life rests in his hands, not in mine. My salvation rests in His hands, not in mine. That's good news for me. I don't know about you, but if it were up to me, I'd be in trouble. But I rest in what He has done. His righteousness has provided for me. It is upon His righteousness that I rest, that I have been given the gift of eternal life. Death has no authority over me. Because of His resurrection, I also escape sin's verdict. Sin's verdict is death. For the wages of sin, the consequences of sin is death. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, death entered the world. But because Jesus has conquered death, I also escape sin's verdict. The verdict passes off of me onto Jesus on the cross that my verdict died with him. And now I've been raised back to life in Jesus. Death is pursuing me. Death eventually catches me. But through Jesus, death does not have the final word. Because of what Jesus did, I escape death's consequences. Which means this, death doesn't win. Isn't that great news? That's the gospel. Whatever you're facing in life, death doesn't win. Sin doesn't win. Whatever you're facing, whatever consequences you are facing that sin has brought into your life, whatever brokenness you're facing because of what sin has brought into your life, death doesn't have the final word. Man, you've heard me say it often, and I've lived it in my own life. Sin destroys, doesn't it? Sin devastates. Sin kills. It kills relationships. It kills your finances. It kills healthiness between your, with you and your spouse, between you and your kids. It, it kills how I work. It kills my motivation. It kills my dependence in God. It kills my faith. Like sin is destructive. We all have levels of brokenness in our life because of the consequences of sin. But what Jesus says in the resurrection is sin doesn't win. The brokenness doesn't win. I have conquered death. The brokenness doesn't have the final word. Jesus wins in the end. And even if the brokenness takes my life through sickness, through disease, through an accident, through an old age, whatever happens, even when the brokenness takes my life, it doesn't have the final word. As Paul said, for me to pass from death into life is to enter into the presence of Jesus. Paul's attitude was this, the best thing you can do for me is to kill me. Like, how do you defeat a guy with that attitude? How do you discourage a guy with that attitude? The best thing that could happen to me is to, for death to enter my, my frame. Death doesn't have the final word. So here's what I want to leave you with. Live like a person who's been made alive. Live like a person who's been made alive. We have been made alive in Jesus. Whatever sin has destroyed in your life, Jesus provides life and healing and redemption and restoration. Your sin died with Jesus. Lean into Him. Don't be defeated by sin. Don't live in sin's bondage. Don't live in sin's shackles. Live like a free person. Your sin died with Jesus. Here's the truth. That if we could get this, again, it would impact how we live everyday life. 
Did you know every sin, wrap your mind around this, every sin that you have committed, that you are committing, and that you will commit died with Jesus on the cross. All my past, present, and future sins died with him. Why do we allow sin to hold us down and shackle us and fall prey to its temptation again and again and again when my sin died with him? Live like it. Don't resurrect your sin. Live like it's conquered. Live like it's conquered. Live like a free person in Jesus. Here's the good news. When sin does enter the picture, when it tears us down again, when we fall prey to that temptation again, when addiction wins again, right? Jesus is there to do what? To pick us back up and to say, Devin, sin doesn't win. Live like a free person. I'm going to read a text that we're going to come back to one of the last weeks of this series, but I want to get it into your, your hearts and minds now, and then we're going to come back and walk through it in, in, like I said, one of our last few weeks. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Romans chapter 6. I just want to read the first 14 verses, and then we're going to end today. This is Paul talking about this very issue. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? What Paul's saying is if, if grace is so incredible, should we sin so that grace should be made known? And then he uses a strong phrase, by no means. Like That's not how we live when we live in grace. How can we who have died to sin, listen to his language, how can we who have died to sin still live in it? Paul says you're dead to sin if you're in Jesus. Verse 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Meaning that when Jesus died on the cross, he took my death upon him. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. My sin died with Jesus. When he was raised back to life to walk in newness of life, It was as if I were there with him, that I was raised to walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if when we have been united with him, with Jesus, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Live like a free person, Paul's saying. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Have you ever had that feeling? Like I'm a slave to my sin. I'm a slave to this addiction. I'm a slave to doing this again. I don't want to look at that, but I find myself looking at it again. I don't want to behave in this way, but I find myself behaving that way again. Paul says you're not a slave to sin. Verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Then look how he ties it to us. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. How? On your own works? On your own merit? Because you're a good person? Because you're better than your neighbor? No. In who? In Christ Jesus, that when he died, my sin died with him, that when he was raised back to life, I was raised to walk in newness of life. Verse 12, here's Paul's response to all this. So let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Don't let sin, he says, rule and reign in your heart and life. Don't let sin be on the throne of your heart. Don't let the big I sit on the throne of your heart. That's what sin is, right? S-I-N is putting me in the middle of everything. Don't let sin rule and reign in your heart. Verse 13, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under Grace. Paul says you have been set free in Jesus. You have been given the gift of eternal life. God has poured his grace out 
on you. Therefore, live unto righteousness, not because of how great you are, but because of how awesome Jesus is and what Jesus has done on your behalf. I'm a visual person. And so when I read Paul's words here and think about sin in my life, I think about literally taking myself and putting the shackles back on my hands and my wrists and ankles. That when I allow sin to rule and reign in my heart, I am reshackling myself to sin when I've been set free. Jesus has done everything necessary for you to live life pleasing to God. He has set you free. Do not allow sin to reign and rule in your life. You've been made alive. Live like a person who is alive. You have passed from death to life. Not in the future, if you know Jesus. Right now, you are alive in Jesus. Isn't that good news? Let's bow our heads for prayer.